Father, we thank you. We thank you for you. Lord, you are awesome. You are an awesome God. Lord, you love us. You care about us. You're involved in our lives. You deliver us from the messes that we make. Lord, we, we're just so grateful. And, and as we praised you in song, we now praise you and worship you by opening your word and giving heed to what you would say to us today. And we pray that you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, through your word. Help us, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that are open and ready to receive from you. We need to hear from you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Title of today's teaching is, Be Resolute. And kind of a subtitle is, In the Will of God. <laughs> And today, you know, in looking at our society and what's going on and where everybody's at, uh, today it's no longer a virtue to hold on to well-established social norms. You know, the right and wrong or good and bad that our culture lives by now uh, is dictated by whoever has the loudest voice in the media, right? <laughs> and unfortunately... Many Christians are caught up in this as well. You know, no one wants to be irrelevant, right? <laughs> Got to be relevant. No one wants to be culturally out of it. Uh, and if you really take a stand, if you, if you really stand up for, for God's truth, well, you'll, you'll, you'll lose Facebook friends or, or followers on Instagram. Oh, the horror of it all. <laughs> Churches and even entire denominations now are changing their doctrines, not to align themselves more with the Word of God, but to, to really line up with whatever the culture says is right this week. You know, they'll have to change it next week because have you noticed that last few years? It's like hot and cold running culture, you know, it's like everything's just going, kind of going all over the place. Uh, a friend of mine back in the 70s, uh, he late 70s, early 80s, he wrote a lot of Christian songs. And uh, this one song that he wrote, the main line in it that repeats over and over again is, the truth is a funny thing. It's a funny, funny thing. It's always the same. <laughs> and the reason that is, is because real truth comes from God, who is our creator. That's where real truth is. In fact, God is truth. And because God does not change, Truth does not change. What God said is true 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, whenever he said it, it is still true today, regardless of what our society says, regardless of what the culture is trying to push us into. We know that God became a man. We understand that. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Fully God, yet fully man at the same time when he was here on earth. And in fact, when you get right down to it, Jesus Christ, he was and is the embodiment of truth. Think about that. He said so himself in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, Jesus is still truth, and what he said is still true. Hebrews 13.8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? I am so glad that that is true. <laughs> we don't have to worry about God changing his mind. You know, aren't you glad for that? You know, that God doesn't uh, up in heaven sometimes change his mind and go, well, you know, it used to be about grace through faith. You know, you put your faith in, in what uh, I've done for you and on the cross, and, and by my grace, I'll save you. But you know I've changed my mind. Now, you know, you're going to have to give half of your net worth to the church. Uh, just make the check out to Tony Jodro. No. <laughs> or or you, you have to climb the Himalayas or, or whatever else. I'm so glad that God doesn't do that. I'm so glad he doesn't change his mind, that what he told us in his word is still absolute truth, and he will not change his mind. He, he can't because God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. The word of God doesn't change. 
And it is by the unchanging word of God that you and I are supposed to be living. And Jesus said in, in Matthew 4.4, 4, when the devil had tempted him and all, he answered and said, it is written, man shall live or shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the way Jesus lived. <laughs> that's, that's how he lived. It was by the word of God. Everything he did, everything he said, you can find it in the word of God. You can look in the Old Testament and see exactly what Jesus said and did right there. And folks, you and I, we're supposed to be Christians-like, right? We're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to live like he lived. And Jesus even prayed that we would be sanctified, which means set apart from the rest of the world by our belief and our adherence to the Word of God. At the Last Supper, he prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, there may be people that want to argue whether, whether the Bible is true or not, whether it's God's word or, or not, or whatever. But you know what? My money's on Jesus. <laughs> I'm going with what he says. <laughs> your word is truth. And every time you see Jesus quoting scripture, he is, he is quoting it authoritatively. This is the Word of God. The Word of God says this. The Word of God says that. And, and you know, there are people today, Christians. So well, if I live by the Word of God today, I'll be ridiculed. I might even get canceled, you know? It's like, so what? Think about this. They tried to cancel Jesus, right? How'd that work out? Here we are over 2,000 years later. We're praising Him. We're worshiping Him. He didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore. And Jesus tells us this in John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, and get this, him my father will honor. You want God the Father to honor you? I believe, folks, that we are coming to a time when there will be open or, or even government-sanctioned persecution of true followers of Jesus Christ. We see the seeds already. We see things going in that direction. You and I are told we must accept same-sex marriage as the norm. The government's telling that. And if you aren't real careful as to how your bylaws are written as a church... They can, they can come after you because, oh, you're just being selective, whatever. But if it's in the bylaws way before it happens, then, hey, right now you're kind of safe. But they're also telling us that, you know, uh, transgender medical procedures on your minor children, uh, you have to go along with. In fact, a lot of schools, a lot of uh, government agencies are, are not telling parents when they're going to do these things. Yeah. And if, if you speak out against it, you're going to be in trouble with the law. Folks, it's happening already. I, I read about two guys. One, there was this young man. I, it looked like he was barely, barely out of high school. He was reading the Bible aloud across the street from a pride event, uh, and he was arrested without warning, without explanation, back in July on the 29th in Watertown, Wisconsin. Uh, and they said, well, you were using a megaphone. That's after he was hauled away. They said, well, you, you know, you were using a PA system and you were disturbing the peace. <laughs> and another man was arrested this last June uh, at a, another pride event for reading the Bible. And this happened to be in Reading, Pennsylvania. He gets, gets busted for reading in Reading, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and folks, the thing is that it's coming, all right? If the rapture doesn't happen very soon, then we're going to experience, I believe, we're going to experience a time of persecution like a lot of other believers are across the world right now. We get this idea that because we're Americans, you know, and, and God obviously has to have an American flag tacked up behind the throne in heaven, right? You know, <laughs> that we're special, we're different. We're going to get treated different. Folks, we're not different. The people in... Islamic countries, 
the people in communist countries, the people that are being persecuted for their faith and dying today, this week, are, 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 are just as much loved by God as we are. <laughs> Folks, we need to be prepared. If we don't decide right now that we're going to live according to the truth, according to the Word of God, we will flounder, and eventually we'll capitulate. <laughs> I've seen people like that all the time, that, that give up on Christ because they just kind of haven't committed to, I'm going to follow Christ no matter what. And then they end up embracing the world system. Remember, we have been called to follow Christ, to walk or to live as He lived. And today, we're going to see a, a little bit of what that means in how Jesus was resolute in doing what God the Father had called him to do, doing what was right in God's eyes, regardless of the opposition. Now, Isaiah, after reminding Israel of why they were in such a mess, not because God couldn't help them, but because they persisted in sin, and now God has Isaiah give them some hope, some more details of God's servant, Jesus Christ, who would save his people. And again, we pick it up with Isaiah speaking prophetically for Jesus. In essence, we're listening to Jesus speaking through Isaiah. Look at verse 4 of Isaiah 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. And you think back how fitting <laughs> this prophecy was for how Jesus lived. The religious leaders, they were astounded at Jesus. They, they were blown away. They hated him. <laughs> they wanted to do away with him, but, but they were blown away by his wisdom and his knowledge of the Word of God. In Matthew 13, 54, it says, When he, that's Jesus, had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? And they were always trying to catch Jesus in his words. They were, remember, they were always asking you know, lame questions, and, and Jesus called them out on that several times. But... As we see here in Isaiah, he knew how to speak. The Father showed him. The Holy Spirit led him. And we see Jesus, as he says here, uh, speaking, offering rest to the weary. Like Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, those are awesome things. But notice what Jesus did every morning. He listened to the Lord God. You see that? He, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Do you wake up every morning wanting to know God's will for your life? Do you do that? Do you, do you wake up praying and asking Him? You know, asking Him to awaken your ear to hear what He would say? You know, King David, uh, he did that. And he recorded in Psalm 63, 1. He says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Folks, do you thirst to know him more? Do you thirst and do you hunger after righteousness? Do you, do you want to know what God has for you? Do, do, you, do you wake up in the morning and pray and then they get into his word? God, speak to me. I want to know your will. Well, if you do, that's great. We should be, all of us. But here's another question. Once you know his will, once you have seen in his word what his will is for you, do you set about to do it? Do you set about, are you committed to doing God's will in your life? Or do you blow it off? <laughs> do you push it to the back of your mind? Do you turn away from it? Well, I know I should, but... I want to do this. I want to do that. Look at verse 5. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. We recently read what God, through the prophet Samuel, 
uh, said to King Saul uh, when Saul disobeyed God in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. It says, so Samuel said, has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. See, Jesus wasn't stubborn. Jesus wasn't rebellious, he says here in verse 5. He didn't turn away from God and God's commands. He obeyed the Father. And as we saw last week, he was rewarded for that when he poured out his soul unto death. <laughs> he obeyed completely. And again, we're to be Christ-like. We shouldn't turn away from the Lord or what the Lord says. No matter who is watching, no matter who is listening, who, no matter who's going to read your posts, <laughs> no matter what they might do to us, we should not turn away. Uh, look at the example that Christ set for us in verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. What an accurate prophecy about what they would do to Jesus. And remember, this is 700 years before it happened. <laughs> but the point here that Jesus is letting us know that Isaiah is bringing out is that Jesus didn't turn away from God's will in his life. <laughs> he endured all of it because he was surrendered to the will of the Father. He had determined beforehand not to be rebellious, even though it meant suffering and death, even though it meant he was going to get spit on. He was going to get beaten. Look at verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. See, Jesus trusted the Father completely, just as we're supposed to. He knew. He knew what we say we know. And that is, the Lord God will help me. Do you know that? Do you know that if you commit your ways to God, that he will help you? Do you know if you surrender to him, he will be with you? You know, Hebrews 13, 6 reminds us of that. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? A lot of people, they say that. They say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm familiar with that verse. But when it comes right down to it, a lot of times people don't live like that. You know, they act like, oh, they're going to get me, they're going to get me out. I, I can't do that. You know, I can't say that. I can't speak up here or here. I can't, you know, you know I'm just going to have to compromise a little bit right here. Folks, the Lord's with us. He is our helper. We shouldn't fear. Because anything that gets to us, whether it's a demon or whether it's a man or whatever, it has to go through God first. And he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. Always give us a way of escape that we can bear it. You know, and they tried to disgrace Jesus, as he says here. He said, but I, I won't be ashamed. See, they tried, but they couldn't succeed. And when you think about it, the resurrection of Jesus Christ wiped out all of their arguments and all of their ridicule, all of that. It was like, yeah, that's all out of the way. He's the risen Savior. He's approved by God. In fact, that was part of Peter's first sermon in Acts chapter 2. He was a man approved by God. The resurrection proved it. And here's, here's the thing. Jesus wasn't focused on the immediate. He wasn't focused on his comfort. He wasn't focused on his popularity. Instead, like, like we should, he kept the big picture in mind. He had the Father in mind. He had us in mind. He had e eternity in view. He knew what Romans 11 says. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. See, when we put everything that goes on in the light of eternity, when we put this verse, in Romans 10, 11, in the light of eternity, what little we may suffer here, whether it's ridicule or outright abuse from persecutors, when all the smoke settles, folks, we will not be ashamed. 
Even though Jesus knew that he would be beaten, have his beard yanked out, spit on, and ultimately crucified, Jesus was resolute. Notice that, what he says here in verse 7. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. Folks, a flint is a hard rock. It was used for making arrowheads, for making knives. It won't bend, folks. A flint will not bend. The, the Net Bible translates it, I am steadfastly resolved. Think of all of the opposition that Jesus faced throughout his earthly ministry. You know, Satan tried to stop him, tried to tempt him to veer off of his path that God had, the Father had called him to. You know, Jesus never slowed down, though. <laughs> he never stopped. He never even slowed down. He kept going on his mission. And in fact, he became outwardly even more resolute in the weeks just prior to the cross. As he and his, his followers were on their way to Jerusalem, Jesus, knowing that that's where he would be crucified, Luke <laughs> tells us this in Luke 9.51, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, to be crucified and be received up into heaven, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Nothing was going to deter him. Nothing was going to keep him from Jerusalem. He had an appointment to make. He had to keep God's will. He had to pay for our sins. <laughs> he knew that. He set his face like a flint to go towards the cross, not away from it. You know, when... Peter tried to stop them from arresting Jesus. Remember that night the mob came? <laughs> Peter drew out his sword and cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant, after Jesus telling him, hey, Peter, put, a, put your sword in your sheath, man. He goes, stop, you know, chill, brother. <laughs> Matthew 26, 53 and 54, Jesus goes on to say, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Think what resolve Jesus had to have had at that moment. Think about it. Put yourself in His place. You know you're going to get crucified the next day. You know these guys are coming, they're, they're arresting you, they're there to take you, arrest you, you're going to get beaten, you're going to get whipped, you're going to get spit on, you're going to be a bloody mess in just a matter of hours, and you could avoid it. Look, you know, followers are all ready, they're, they're ready for a battle. And you know, you could call down the angels, you know, you could get out of this. But he didn't do that. <laughs> he set his face like a flint. Nothing was going to stop him from God's will. And you see that kind of Christ-like resolve throughout the book of Acts. You see it in the followers of Christ. You, beginning with the first martyr, Stephen. You know, when he was brought before the high priest in the Sanhedrin and brought before them under false charges, you know, he could have been quiet. He could have denied the charges and maybe got off with just a beating or something, right? But he didn't. He took seriously the Great Commission, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He was committed to preach the gospel even to those who were at the time vehemently opposing the gospel. And I say at the time because one of the guys there was Saul of Tarsus. And I believe God used Stephen to prepare Saul's heart. And speaking of Saul, we know him better as Paul the Apostle. And he's a great example of being resolute in the faith. You, know, you go through the book of Acts, you see how many times he was beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked, even stoned to death at one point, drug out of the city, thrown on the garbage dump kind of thing, thrown on a heap of trash. And you read all of that stuff and you see over and over again his resolve because he believed what he preached. He believed in the resurrection. He believed that he was supposed to preach the gospel. You know, in classic Paul in Acts chapter 21, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's already been warned. 
You know, you go there, man, you're, you're going to get it. <laughs> and he's at Philip the Evangelist's house, and, and he believed he was supposed to go to Jerusalem, even though all the rest of them didn't. And this prophet named Agabus comes to Philip's house, and he warns Paul, does the whole thing with his belt and dance around, you know, hey, you know, they're going to bind you and all this stuff. Uh, and, and he tells him, you're going to get arrested, man. You're going to be bound. You're, you, you're in trouble, dude, if you go to Jerusalem. Look at Paul's response in Acts 21, verses 12 through 14. Now, when he heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. And I believe it was the Lord's will. You know, after Paul was arrested, he preached the gospel to, and gave his testimony to the mob and then to the Sanhedrin with the high priest there. He preached the gospel big time to them. And they were going to tear him apart. But, but as he was laying there in a cell, chained up one night, uh, the Lord Jesus, his helper, remember? The Lord is my helper. The Lord was there to help him. He appeared to Paul and encouraged him. In Acts 23, 11, it says, But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So that was God's will. Paul was resolved to do it. Now, granted, everything he did, everything that any believer is ever successful at with any kind of of lasting value has to be led by the Lord. It has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Paul was. He he was led by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that gave him the will and the ability to do what pleased God. And the persecution and the trials of Paul didn't stop. Later on, when you get home, uh, these three chapters will kind of open your eyes if you're not aware of all that he suffered. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 6, and 2 Corinthians 11, you can see all the things that, that happened to Paul because he was resolute in obeying the Lord and fulfilling his ministry, even if it meant death. Now, after explaining that we, you and I, have this treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in earthen vessels, that's our earthly bodies, and and, uh, getting into a little bit of the pain and and that that he suffered uh, because of his commitment to preach the gospel, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4, 13 and 14. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Do you know that? You know what? If you have to suffer for the Lord and even if you have to die for him, you're faithful to him, folks, he's going to lift you up. He's going to be there for you. He's going to lift you up and you're going to spend eternity with him. Paul and his buddies believed the gospel. They believed what Jesus said about going into all the world and preaching the gospel. So they preached no matter what. They knew ultimately Jesus would rise them from the dead. They knew that. Are you convinced of that yourself? (laughs) They didn't get discouraged. They didn't give up because of that, even though they were suffering for their obedience. (laughs) And again, like Jesus, they kept the big picture in view. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, For the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. See, Paul considered all the the, the pain in his life that he was suffering for the gospel as temporary. It was just a light affliction. 
compared to the exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Folks, whatever we could face here is just momentary, like Paul says. It's lightweight compared to the glory that we will experience in heaven. We have to resolve that in our minds. We have to say, yes, I will, I will count that <laughs> as true. I will believe that, what God says. We've got to decide today, folks. We've got to set our faces like a flint to obey God, no matter what. No compromise. That's not Christ-like. The world wants us to compromise. Now, there are some things that you can compromise on, right? There's some things like, hey, what do you want, uh, where do you want to go uh, for dinner tonight? You know, let's, let's go out to a restaurant. Hey, how about we go to this restaurant? And the wife says, well, yeah, I, I was kind of thinking about that, you know, about this other restaurant. We can compromise on that. You betcha. Well, let's go ahead and go over there. It's only one meal out of our lives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But when it comes to obeying God, we can't compromise, folks. We can't compromise. We have to put everything into the big picture. We have to realize we're going to stand before him one day. Jesus didn't compromise. And, and you know, something else, and, and I think this is so important. Jesus had set his face like a flint to do all of God's will way before the cross. We're reading here in Isaiah 700 years before it happened. He had already set his face like a flint before he ever came to earth. I'm going to do what the Father, what he wants me to do. I'm going to redeem mankind. He made his decision to do what God had sent him to do way before the night that he was arrested. See, he didn't have to decide if he was going to do the will of God at every difficulty. Oh, I'm getting opposition from the, from the religious leaders. What should I do? You know, should I compromise and make them happy or continue to speak the truth? Oh, gee, i got to make that decision. You know, uh, here they come to arrest me. Uh, now should I let them or uh, should I wipe them out like Elijah did to those who came to arrest him? Remember that one? Well, if I am the man of God, then, you know, may fire come down from heaven and strike you and your 50 soldiers. <laughs> that happened several times. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, Jesus didn't have to say, no, okay, now I'm standing before the Sanhedrin and the high priest tonight. They're, they're pressing to know if I believe that I'm the Messiah. I know I am, but, but should I just kind of recant or, or, or not say anything and kind of try and save my skin? Or now they're forcing me to carry my cross to Mount Calvary. Should I call down legions of angels uh, to wipe them all out and, and not go through with this? Even though I know it's God's will? Folks, if we're not resolved to obey God and we wait until each trial comes to decide for that moment, for that incident, if we're going to obey, folks, we'll fail. We have to resolve right now. We have to commit ourselves to the Lord and say, God, by your strength, by your power, I will obey you even to death and then live that kind of a life. We have to decide right now. We can't wait to each little, little thing that comes up. Jesus had already made his mind up. He had set his face like a flint to do the will of the Father who sent him. In fact, he said in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, how about you? Okay. Are you set to do the will of God no matter what? Think about that for a minute. No matter what. Business dealings, interpersonal relationships. We have a lot easier time, I think, in saying that, oh, I would die for Jesus. I would die for my faith. We have a lot easier time doing that than actually dying to self on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got to decide right now. Here's a question for you. Is the gospel and your testimony for Jesus Christ really worth dying for? Is it? If it is, then it's worth living for. It's worth dying to self then. It's worth living for the Lord and His will in our lives. 
We've got to decide that right now. Let's stand up and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these challenging things that we see in your word. Father, I pray that you have spoken to each and every person here this morning. And I pray that each and every person, that as they have sat listening to your word, Lord, that they have committed to you already in their hearts. They will serve you. They will put their faith in you no matter what. Help us, Lord. Lord, right now, if, if there are those that need to do that, just, Lord, just please do that. Please, Lord, convince them that, yes, you are worth dying for because you died for us, but you're also worth living for. Father, please, do that work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's praise him with one last song before we go.